Kirk. And uh, if you want to spend the whole 45 minutes of me talking about Gordon, you can. You should see his bio. I'm not going to go through it all. So I'll let Gordon sort of finite what he's done. But uh, Gordon is representing the, the Surrey Emergency Amateur Radio Group. And he's going to talk to you about communications. Obviously, he'll let finish off communications, especially uh, during and after an emergency, or a large scale emergency. Uh, Gordon started out as a paramedic, and now he's a senior. What? Senior wireless service delivery. Wireless service <laughs> delivery is what he called. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. We've got a, we've got a microphone. Gordon's going to do his best to be loud if he needs to switch over. But I'm going to introduce you, Gordon. We have 45 minutes in. I think there's a QA at some point. Yeah, Anybody sure. has questions? Yeah. All right. So have at it, Gordon. Thanks. Okay. So I'll just make sure you can hear me without the mic, everybody. Okay. And you can see the screen with me standing here because I've got to push the, the, the button to. To, to make it work. So, so uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the Surrey Emergency Program and the use of amateur radio, but we're going to go beyond that. We're going to be talking uh, about uh, emergency communications for non-amateur radio operators as well. And uh, so I'm, uh, CPAR, the Surrey Emergency Program, is an emergency program based in the city of Surrey under the fire service and they also provide the neighborhood emergency preparedness program. We have a radio club as well within Surrey, Surrey Amateur Radio Club or communications that uh, provides all kinds of events. We provide training, we provide help getting radios installed, help getting people on the air. We have what's called a GOTA or a get on the air net and uh, we make sure that uh, people are able to um, actually use the radios that they're expecting to use in a, in a disaster. Uh, my day job is I work for Ecom. As, he, as uh, uh, was said, I retired from the BC Annual Service as the uh, Executive Director for the province responsible for communications for the entire province of British Columbia and the dispatch system uh, within that. And now I work for Ecom and Ecom provides 911 service to 98% of the province of British Columbia. We provide dispatch services for police and fire and we forward the calls to the ambulance dispatch as well as we provide a public safety radio network for police, fire and ambulance. So this radio, commercial radio, uh, Langley Township Fire out there will have a colored version of this on their belt. These are somewhere around six and a half thousand dollars and we provide a hardened radio system which since it's been turned on and I say that carefully because you never know what can go wrong uh, in uh, 20, 2015 it's at 100% uh, uptime it's not it has it has not failed and there's multiple levels of redundancy knowing that we live in an earthquake zone so um, today our goals are going to be to talk about situational awareness uh, family communications, neighborhood communications, understanding the available technology, and that's not just amateur radio. I'm not going to teach you how to get an amateur radio license or to use it today. I'm going to talk about building your plan. So what it is not, it is not about bugging out. It's not about a 72-hour kit. It's not about uh, uh, fuel, food, water, sheltering in place, security. My focus sp is specifically on a communications plan for you. And uh, the, the, one of the best quotes that I can think of is there's a, a podcaster that, uh, from the um, a survival podcast that says, your preparedness should help you your, live your life better if times get tough and even if they don't. So we're talking about how can you, how can you uh, use your preparedness to your advantage uh, in your day-to-day -day life. So we're going to talk first about situational awareness. And on here, all of these... Uh, uh, icons are things that you should be aware of in terms of having on your phone or, or having signed up for. Weather Canada, you can get weather alerts and you would know that if you got the weather alert that a snowstorm was coming and hopefully you wouldn't have been one of the people camping on the Alex Fraser Bridge for 12 hours when they were, when they were stuck. As well as wind, if you're hearing that the wind is coming, well are you ready for power outages, those types of things. Um, this is wildfires, particularly important at this time of the year. As a matter of fact, my son called me the other day and he says, uh, Dad, I'm in Port Alberni and the road's closed. And my hotel's on the other side in Qualicum. I spent the night in my car. And I said, well, first off, if you called me, you could have gone to my friend John's, who's a ham radio operator as well, house in Port Alberni and had a nice bed to sleep in. 
but it was at that point, do you have your GPS and your radio? No, it's a no tell, you know, typical, uh, you know, young adult, right? Nothing can go wrong. But he did fuel up his car and buy some stuff and finally made the four hour uh, instead of 40 minute trek out to get there. But the point of that is, is that situational awareness, you might have known that they were going to close the road. You might not. In this case, probably not, because once the fire started moving down, they started water bombing it and brought debris over the road. And then you can get, uh, obviously, dry DC if you're traveling. Um, it'll tell you about highway closures and those types of things. It was particularly important uh, about a year and a half ago when we had the flooding. Twitter will tell you what's going on. And city, you can sign up for news alerts. So if there's something big happening, you can sign up for those and you will get some information on what's going on. And then we have what's called intrusive alerts in British Columbia. These are the times when your phone goes off and you are not expecting it and it will go off in the middle of the night, those types of things. So those are sent by geographical area and it, uh, it goes to the cell tower and if, if it's meant for somebody in Surrey, but you're on the border to Langley, you're still gonna get it. And it's, it's done that way on purpose and there's a very select group of people that can trigger one of those. The province can, the RCMP can, um, those types of things. So they're, they're, they're certainly not done lightly and there's a lot of uh, paperwork and things that have to happen in order to give one of those alerts out. Um, so it's important that you have situational awareness and you know what's going on. So I'm gonna talk now about just what some of the alerts are really quick. There are, from the River Forecast Center, and you hear this all the time, you heard it three weeks ago in the news, high stream flow advisory, flood watch, or flood warnings. And just a little tidbit that um, is probably actually pretty sad, the high stream flow advisory is just a warning. More people die during high stream flow, uh, uh, high stream flow advisories than flood warnings. So uh, they walk onto the bank to see what's going on. The river has undercut the bank. It gives way and you're unable to, to, to fight that. I'll also say that uh, in my career as a paramedic, every year at flood season time, they would send out reminders to us as paramedics that your ambulance will float in 15 inches of water, the flat bottom, and it comes up. And um, this last uh, flood in Abbotsford, I was going out to look after one of our sites being escorted in in my big pickup up to the headlights and water. And as you're going down the road, you see the cars with the kind of the, the engine on the road and the car turns sideways with the back end in the ditch. Because the engine's heavy, the back end starts to float, it turns in the stream flow and down it goes. And when we got to where we were, we were going, the Abbotsford police officer that was escorting us in in his pickup truck said, oh, we're gonna have to find a different way out because the back of my truck started to float as I was coming in. Now, I had 500 liters of diesel in the back to, to look after a generator, so I wasn't gonna float. Um, but that's the type of thing that can happen. As well as the road was covered in water and one of the city trucks not on the road we were on was going down and it was a you know, full-size pickup with a high top canopy on it, drove down the road and the road had washed out and the truck completely disappeared under the water. The people were okay, they got out and they, you know, they got picked up and got over. And about 40 minutes later, another vehicle down the road right on top of it because they couldn't block the road off because the wood blocks would just float away. So driving in flood waters is, is certainly something that, that, uh, that you don't want to do. And um, that's why it's important to know to uh, what, what the various stages are. And then we have, uh, Evacuation station, evacuation order, please leave. I couldn't tell you how many times during wildfires that we would get a phone call in uh, to the ambulance dispatch asking for us to come rescue somebody that had been hurt, trying to put a sprinkler on the roof or something when they should have been gone. What they didn't realize is that we can't just drive an ambulance in, we had to make arrangements for either air support with a helicopter, find a proper road that wasn't on, in, on, on fire on both sides um, to, to get in. And it's not just, you, you, may, you may get no help. And I would just say that there's a picture from uh, Fort McMurray, uh, that truck. Would you like to be in that truck with your family? These, now, these people didn't have a lot of warning because it, you know, when they said to leave, the traffic and things, uh, I mean, this, this, this person didn't do it on purpose. This person maybe left as soon as they were told. That's how quickly, how bad it got. And if you've ever driven through a forest fire um, in a vehicle, 
that is hot. It'll melt the decals off the side of your ambulance, and you can ask me how I know that one. So um, uh, again, with evacuation orders, we need you to we need you to leave. And the last thing here is weather warnings, and this is particularly important. There's watches warnings, special weather statements, or advisories. And uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'll just give you a quick highlight of these. Um, uh, I, I would say. When, when they give you watches or warnings, you should take that as, maybe I should stay home today. How would you like to be that person in that car right there? Been there a while, right? That's the Alex Fraser Bridge last winter. And that person, those cars were stuck there. Matter of fact, my neighbor, who is a retired Surrey firefighter, works for Main Roads. They couldn't get their plows across the bridge to open it up because cars were stuck and they had to, to go pull them out. And I would go, if that was me, in most cases, I might actually be pretty comfortable. I've got a way to heat some water, have something warm to drink, have a blanket. Uh, you know, so there are reasons, even in the city, to be prepared to stay in your car. As well as, if there was a radio in that car, you could easily have told your family where you were. Sir? There was a joke on the Alex Fraser Bridge back a while ago. Yes. And uh, I just managed to get to the bridge just through the off ramp. Right. But everybody else on that bridge was stuck yes. for like a good six, seven hours. Yeah. And yeah. then I managed to find a way around it. But yeah. I was like, wow, if I had just right yeah. further down, I'd have been yeah. stuck there. Yeah, well, and there's reasons, uh, safety reasons for everybody, including if a person's despondent enough to be thinking about jumping, they may then go in front of a vehicle and then it, 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 all of a sudden now your life is impacted if they should be seriously injured or die uh, with something that you didn't really uh, plan on doing. So there's reasons why they would, they would close it. So uh, a severe weather watcher warning. Um, there's less severe events. Um, and watches are where conditions are favorable for something to develop but hasn't developed yet. And then there's severe weather which is imminent or it is occurring. And they can be issued up to 24 hours in advance but they could also be issued within minutes. If you know a tornado and you say that, but there was a tornado last summer off of the water spout. No, it was a tornado. It actually hit UBC and damaged a building and some trees. So, so uh, just weird things that are going on. And the last thing are weather statements and advisories. So it's something that could be developing and the weather people aren't quite yet able to figure out. And it might also be issued because Washington State has chosen at this point to issue a, a bulletin nearby the border. So our Environment Canada will issue it to give you the awareness so that people don't say, well, you didn't tell me and it didn't meet our criteria, but it met theirs. So there's that. So there is something called a weather radio, which is this thing here. You can buy these. You can buy them built into little radios to crank up things. That's just one that's a home version. And it will go off and alert you if there's a, if there's a certain category of weather and it can flash a light, it can set an alarm. And they do it. There's uh, seven, there's eight weather channels that exist across the country. And you can go, and when that happens, it will open up the radio and it will start telling you what that warning is. And it is a, it is a very active thing. Mine goes off all of the time in the winter with, with things about uh, wind or weather. As a matter of fact, I can also say that mine went off uh, in August 2017. We had that windstorm that came through and 700,000 people were without power. And uh, so mine went off that morning and I went out and I think we, our ham radio group uh, has coffee and uh, breakfast on Saturday mornings and then we uh, go down to uh, where our building is uh, next to the Surrey RCMP detachment and uh, meet. Uh, so when I got home, I, you know, I checked uh, BC Hydro, the outage, and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I actually had to go pick up my son in Manning Park that day. So my other son had just come home and said, Dad, it took me like three hours to get home from Alder Grove because there were trees across the highway. So I knew my youngest son was safe at the cabin he was at. And uh, we went, and on the way to, to go getting him pick up a few hours later, we went by the bank, and it was on purpose to teach my kids a lesson. I said, we're going to go get some money. And we got there. Of course, the ATM wasn't working because there was no power. And just at that time, somebody came in. Well, this isn't working. How am I going to pay for my bus ride? Uh, you know, I can't get money. And I said, just go tell the bus driver the power is out. He'll let you on. But it was a good example for my kids to always keep a little bit of cash. 
So we loaded the truck up, I put a chainsaw in, and we started driving out the highway, Highway 1 from Surrey, and I went off at each exit, 200th Street, completely dark. Gas stations not working, 232, completely dark. Mount Lehman, there was one gas station that was open and had a generator, and there was a huge lineup for people to fill up. The next time I saw any light or any hint of power was the Flying J gas station out by Hope. It was completely dark. And that came through. Now, there was also a warning that was issued, and there was probably three or four hours that you could have gone and filled up your car prior to that warning being issued if you had some way of knowing that it was coming and if you were alert. And then there's one other special uh, type of advisor here that I, everybody should be aware of. It's called the Waffle House Index. Down in the southern states, and this is real, this is not a joke. There's the Waffle House. They're all over in Florida and stuff like that. And they have a, the, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration, FEMA, uses this to tell how severe a disaster is because they never close. And it, they, if they're green, it's doing its full menu. If it's yellow, they've got maybe a power problem and they're serving a partial menu. And if it's red, it's really bad. And they actually use this to determine how bad a disaster is in the area. So it's just kind of an interesting tidbit. So th then the question is, is now what are we preparing for? And this is, uh, th this is certainly an important thing. Are you, do you know the hazards or the risks? Yes? Sometimes they come up so quick that you don't realize. If we had a tornado take place in Surrey, yep. things got to cross the river into Maple River. Yep. And I didn't know it until it actually, the tornado went right past the scrap yard that was in. And I just got a feeling that I was just standing behind the bag or something. Yeah. And I did, and it blew apart the tree. The tree just exploded. Right. Branches going everywhere. And I just happened to be standing behind a vehicle. Yeah. A large vehicle right in the hip of it. So you're very fortunate, that's so for sure. I just got that yeah. impression that I should just stand yeah. right here. Yeah. Because I heard a, a power transformer blow. Yeah. So at the end of the day, everybody does everything possible to keep you safe, but ultimately it's up to you. What you did made the difference. Yeah, so you have to take responsibility and don't say, well, they didn't tell me, so I'm not, I, I, I don't care, I'm not gonna do it. But So I'm asking, what are you preparing for? Uh, is it extreme heat or cold? Um, and did you know that in terms of your communications, most of the time your communication fails will be, uh, it'll be a wind event or it'll be extreme heat or cold that takes out the power because a lot of our radio sites have air conditioning or heat, you don't want them too cold, you don't want them too hot. And uh, those types of days where there's that extra environmental load on the system can cause things to fail. And you, you see that even in California, power outages in the summer on warm sunny days um, because people are cranking up their air conditioners, those types of things. Um, so, and then, you know, uh, you can have things, there was some warning for the flooding in Abbotsford, not a lot. But uh, it, uh, again, if you get that warning, you get up and get out. There's a couple of other things that I'll just mention. There's two things that probably, when you talk about a disaster, a disaster can affect you and not me, or it can affect an entire community. So it might be a disaster to you, but the government will never call it a disaster if your house burns down, if it's just one house. It's a disaster to you. So that's where we start talking about, it's really an emergency in the community, a house on fire, until you get a whole community on fire, and then you're talking it's a disaster. When you get a whole region on fire, then it becomes a catastrophe, where it's beyond the resources in the region to, to help. But there's two things that affect probably most people here most often, or, or most people. One is a job loss and lack of financial preparation. And the other is a loss or injury of a family member. Okay, and I'll just... Like when that went up. Yeah, so what I will say is that um, as a retired paramedic and the number of times I had to deal with that, you need to be prepared for that. You need to have a documentation book and there's somebody out there talking about that where your family finances are. You need to have those plans in place because one, you could lose your job and you need to have that little bit of extra cash or that cushion or a plan how you're going to manage it. And then if something happens either to the breadwinner or, or to the person that looks after the stuff in the family, even though you, know, you make all the money, 
um, where are your investments? So those are a couple of areas. So now I'm going to go on and uh, continue on with this. And this is something that uh, that says that you know stress makes you stupid. Make a checklist, and it does. And if you think okay, people uh, uh, people ask me all the time as a paramedic, how do you deal with those things that you would see and deal with? And I'm going well. First off, I didn't cause it, and I'm going to help. And I can only do what I can only do as a human. That being said, on my way there, I'm dispatched for a car accident. I'm going to go through. What am I going to do? I'm going to keep myself safe, scene safety, look for fuel leaking, that type of thing. What are the hazards? Is it a tanker truck? What's the chemicals that are in it? Then I'm going to go through my protocol, a delicate spine, airway, breathing, circulation. And no, this isn't a first aid talk. But what I'm saying is I have a protocol. And if I get to somewhere that's not breathing, I have different interventions that I can do. It's the same thing when you make a checklist. My power's gone out. What do I do? Well, I go check the breaker. I go, it's not the breaker. My neighbor's out. How do I create power? You know, and I'm not going to tell you how to do that. I'm not going to give you a checklist because my checklist won't work for you. But you do need to think it through. Think of an earthquake scenario. And, uh, you know, what would, what would happen? Do you have a list somewhere like in your front closet? where you're gonna go and that after that earthquake and I'm gonna check if I've got a gas leak. I'm gonna check that um, where my, my water's not leaking. I'm gonna walk around my house and see that my brick chimney hasn't fallen through the roof. You know, those types of things. Uh, and then I'm gonna have a checklist to make sure that I now start after an earthquake trying to find and communicate with my, with my family. So there's a lot of lists that are involved, but I'd say pick one and just do it. And if you do one little thing, you will, uh, you'll, you will start your uh, thing of preparedness. So now we're going to move on a bit to communications, and we're going to talk about family communications. And again, think it through. You don't prepare for an earthquake for the ground shaking. You prepare for the effects of the earthquake, what it could cause, gas outage, power outage, building collapse, that type of thing. Uh, winter storms, when they warn you that wind is coming, that should be your trigger to say, mm, my power might go out, what are my steps? And one of them might be, hey, we're going to check in at noon today when you've gone to work because the power might go out or your kids are at school, you're going to make uh, a, an arrangement with a neighbor uh, to pick them up and I will just give you a little gotcha there. I live in Surrey and Fleetwood and one day we had a bear running around the school and the school decided not to let anybody go. The parents had to come pick them up. There was a lady and uh, Darlene and she um, uh, would come in the neighborhood and pick up many of the kids and take them home to grandma who didn't speak English and she would just walk them home and everybody, the kids all knew to go see Darlene and walk them home but Darlene was not on the emergency contact list and so now they were waiting for the family to come from three bridges over in UBC to pick up a child when there was somebody there that would, if that bear hadn't been there, would have, the kids would have gone out the door, run home and gone home with Darlene and she would have made sure they were safe. So make sure you have a neighborhood contact for your kids registered at the school um, so they can do, so that, that you can get them home. And then uh, when you talk about what are you preparing for, I'm just going to mention power and again I'm going to put on my old paramedic hat. Can you power your power wheelchair or mobility device or do you know somebody? What about ventilators, oxygen concentrators, infusions, intravenous, feeding equipment, chair lifts? Communication devices, and I'm talking about medical ones, not uh, amateur radio. Hearing computers, alarm buttons, uh, nebulizers for asthma, CPAP machines, the power's out, how are you going to sleep? Suction pumps used by people that are living at home that have trouble after feeding, dialysis machines, and medications that require refrigeration or medications that can't get too hot. So those are huge medical areas are, we've evolved so much that you can look after your family at home where you never could 20 years ago, but with that power goes out, and I can tell you the number of times we would get 911 calls, the power's out, my oxygen concentrator isn't working, and I've only got a half a bottle left. So that's something if you, know, you have elderly family or friends, your neighbors, those are important things to look at. I'll also say in your plan, thinking about fuel, no power, um, have you ever tried? People go, oh, I've got gas in my car. I'm going to siphon it. Have you ever tried that? 
you have a new car, it won't work. There's anti-siphon devices in there, and there's little balls. When that car gets hit and rolls over, it prevents the fuel from leaking out and causing a fire and either killing you or putting the responders at risk. So don't assume what you've done will work unless you've tested it. And again, I'm just gonna say, just remember again, um, stress makes you stupid. And the last thing I will say is that picture, it's not about family communications in terms, that's the way your family communicates. <coughs> the point is, is what is that called? There's a name for what they're doing. It's called LARPing. Today's it's live action role playing. They're pretending they're medieval lights and playing. And uh, I just wanna say that many of us do that with our emergency plans. We live action role play, we buy stuff, but we actually never test our plan. And I would certainly encourage you to do that, and it's certainly not the time to do it during a disaster. <coughs> so, now we're gonna move a little bit into communications. Who do you wanna to talk to? Why do you wanna to talk to that person? What can they provide me, or what can I provide them? And how will you talk to them? And my hint there is it depends on how far away they are. Now again, you would say that I'm an amateur radio guy, I'm gonna tell you all about amateur radio. I'm not gonna even go there, I'm gonna go there very briefly, because all of these people in the yellow vests outside, you can go out to them and talk to them afterwards about your specific questions on that. I wanna tell you how the amateur radio can fit into your communications plan, but what you wanna do, first off, is, uh, is, um, is uh, figure those, the answers to those questions out. And then, what do you currently use to communicate with your family? Do you have a home phone? Do you have a cell phone? And that cell phone you can voice and you can text on it. That's part of the phone system. You can have apps on it, Facebook Messenger, Signal, Zello, WhatsApp, um, FaceTime with Apple. You could use a CB radio or FRS, GMRS, which are these little guys, and they come, you, you can get them at Costco, a pack of three. Uh, you can get them at Walmart, you can get them at Cabela's or Bass Pro, those types of things. They're good for about one kilometer and they have 22 channels in them. They are fabulous for your neighborhood. Okay, so they will get only about a kilometer. I don't care what the package says, it says 35 kilometers. <laughs> well, if you're on the, up in the crow's nest of a sailing ship and you're going straight across the water, you might get 35 kilometers, but when buildings get involved, it's, it's not gonna work. So when you say, when I say, what do you currently use? Think of that and think of that. I want you to make a list of every person that you'd want to call in a disaster. Include their work numbers, their school number for the, for the children, um, and also list the addresses of the schools and workplace, and uh, as well as your out of town contact. And I say, write it down or have it printed out. Um, how many saw the picture of the bus crash on the Coquihalla Highway in the winter of this last year? A couple of people died. They showed a picture somebody took on Twitter and then the newscast went up and they showed the blackened spot on the highway and at the end of that they always went to the cell phone laying on the road. I have my cell phone most often here but when I drive it's, it's in my car. When you have a crash that cell phone goes flying. You've now lost your ability to communicate, even if you're fine, or you gotta go find it, and hopefully it's not come out of your car and somebody's not run over it, but, but when you have something written down in a hard copy, if your phone quits working, you can still borrow somebody else's and make that. So, so that's one of the things that uh, is, is critically important. So uh, this is just a sample of, you know, family member contact, where you might be, meeting places and emergency contacts, and it's uh, from a group called PrepperNet out of the US. And I guarantee you, the uh, Build-A-Plan people that are out here in the parking lot will have something like this uh, that's in that. So you need to know the people that you're gonna, you're gonna talk to. And then we're gonna talk about your neighborhood. How are you gonna talk in your neighborhood? You're gonna knock on the door, you're gonna yell uh, down the street. So we would assume that you would have a list of neighbors and again, the neighborhood uh, emergency program for Langley is out there. Surrey has one as well, uh, the green bar on the, on the bottom. And th they tell you how to be prepared in your neighborhood. So we're gonna add one other component as the emergency communications group. Once you're personally prepared and you have some food and water, that type of thing, we can tell you how you might communicate within your neighborhood uh, to, to, to make it work. So there's, of course, amateur radio. There's your cell phone. 
there's texting, there's apps, um, and there's also these little FRS, GMRS radios, and there's, there's a way that you can do that if you have an agreed upon channel, and they will work great. Now, in an apartment building, and Reg here is part of our group, has tried it in his, maybe if he goes on the balcony, somebody can hear him, but the building concrete and stuff won't allow it. So again, you have to test it and see where, where it will work. And in a disaster, it's that community right around you that's gonna be the most important community. Uh, you know, you may be here today, but if you live in Abbotsford and you've come here, how many overpasses or underpasses have you gone through that may not be, that, that may not be standing? As well as I will, I will also just say, okay, so here's the FRS radios. Um, they are called Family Service Radio, FRS, or GMRS, General Mobile Radio Service. That's combined in this radio. There are 22 channels. It's different in the U.S., so I'll just say that. If you go on the internet and look this up, and they talk about mobile, like the radios you put in a car or repeaters, we can't do that in Canada. And there's also something called a multi-use radio system, MERS. That is not in Canada. So we have, for non-licensed people, like if you want some kind of radio, it's either a CB or an FRS, GMRS radio. And one of the things is you can't change the antenna on it, they're locked down. Whereas on these other radios, we can change the antenna, which changes the capacity of that radio to talk further. So they're super simple, they don't require a license. There is one thing, they'll also advertise in these radios that they have privacy tones. And you can go to channel 22 and you can put privacy tone 78 and nobody will hear you. Well, that's really not true. That means that anybody that's not put that privacy tone in won't hear you if they're using tones. But if I turn the tones off on my radio, I'll hear everything that's set on that frequency. So there's no privacy and it actually probably makes your radio deaf if somebody's not got the right tone in by mistake. So we would recommend don't use them, turn them off, and you'll hear if somebody's talking on the channel and you won't interrupt them and they won't interrupt you. So yeah, and, and there's another thing called box voice operated. So when you speak, it will start transmitting or passing your signal through. Turn that off because if you cough through your throat or car drives by, all of that can trigger the radio to come on. And that's as in depth as I'm going to go with the radios, now I'm gonna talk a bit about a plan. So this is Salt Spring Island and they have pods. And if you see in all of these um, things here, this is a little neighborhood and they have all agreed on a certain channel in their radio that they, that they will go to. And they have a way of passing messages, you know, a kilometer or two at a time, all the way down the island if they need to. They have a plan in place for that community. So what, uh, what we, and they, they've all agreed on certain channels. And so we're working on this in, with Surrey in the NEP program. Uh, we're working on a, on a plan where, you know, channel one, and we're not using channel one because it's US, many people will turn a brand new radio on channel one and they start crying for help. <coughs> so that's a national calling frequency. And then we put neighborhoods on two, four, five, six, seven, and then 15 to 22. And why would we do that? Those are the high, um, high power channels in the radio. And then there's some low power ones here that you can talk around your neighborhood and nobody else will probably hear you, even if they're in the next neighborhood. So the idea would be to hopscotch around. So if this neighborhood was channel two, the next neighborhood might be channel four, the next might be channel five, and then we're gonna use channel five again somewhere else down the road. So if you have a neighborhood emergency preparedness program, you can start picking a channel and letting the community, let the, letting the, the, the program know that in your street, this is the channel we're, we're going to use. Now, I'll also say that we've locked out three, so that's a universal calling frequency. This is a, like calling for help nationally, uh, and people, this is what happened in uh, flooding where people trapped on the roof of their house. They were using these, they found them, and were calling for help on channel one. Channel three was kind of like, hey, I'm not in trouble, but who's out there, type of thing. So that's kind of why I, I went through and I looked all throughout the various departments of North America information that I could find. And then this here is, um, you could use these for whatever you want, um, but it was just some suggestions if you first aid, care and shelter, 
you know, those types of things. So that's uh, one of the things that we're going to work. And then here's how it would look. So you have your neighborhood homes that you know would talk on these would talk on these channels here. They could talk to a ham radio operator and. Just about every amateur radio operator in the Lower Mainland, if they know how to use their radio, can talk around the entire Lower Mainland. So that little radio here, again, about $30 probably each, probably in a package of two or three at Costco was $80. This one, it's a ham radio, it can talk around the Lower Mainland with the use of repeaters, things that repeat your signal for you, and it's only about $50. So, um, so... The idea would be if your neighbor had, has a ham radio operator, they would go to your channel on the, on the very inexpensive radio, and if you needed something more, some kind of help or whatever, you would call the ham radio operator who has the capacity in Surrey to get through to the emergency operations center or fire and dispatch, and they would be able to spend, to, to, to pass that need along. Um, and it, the need would be recognized, but it may not, you may not get that help right away because again, uh, how many firefighters are in Surrey approximately on duty at any time? On duty, probably under 80. Under 80 for that entire geography. In a disaster, you are on your own and you need to know that. Don't let anybody tell you that help's coming. First off, your phone might not work and there's no way to get help. And quite frankly, they can only do one or two things at a time. And it's not their fault. You can't, you can't afford to pay for a fire department or police department that can come when 100% of the calls within two minutes. You, you, you just can't do that. So during an emergency, tune your radio to the neighborhood channel. That's the inexpensive one. If you need to communicate with your team leader, you can, you, you can uh, uh, move on to the one, and then the block captain will get it to the ham radio operator that will get it out to the, um, that will, will get it out to the EOC. Okay, I better hurry up. So the next thing here, there's a calling clock. So just just if um, uh, you know the power went out right now, power is out here, not out in Vancouver. How would anybody know to call? Well, when you start not calling them or talking, when they reach out and can't get a hold of you, you have a plan, and you have a, a there's a couple things at amateur radio called the Wilderness Protocol or Channel Three Project, where at certain times of the day. Uh, people go, so this is the top of the hour, and this one here, they would go to an amateur radio frequency for the first 10 minutes here, and then they'd go here, and so, so basically, you pick a time, so um, you, you say, if I'm going to try and reach you during a disaster, every three hours, I'm going to call at the top of the hour, so at noon, for five minutes, I'm going to call, call out to you, and if I don't hear from you, I'll call again at three o'clock. And if that doesn't work, I'll keep doing that. But then we, so you've got some kind of plan to say what time should somebody be listening for me because it's a disaster. They need to look after their own house, but you have coordinated a time where you're gonna try and communicate. And, uh, what, and once you have that, that time coordinated, then we can start talking about how you're gonna contact them. So I'm gonna move now to understanding technology. So there's phone. Your home phone, landline, cell phone, and text. Um, that's all the phone system. So when you send a text on your phone, it is, it's going through the telephone side, the cellular phone side of the system. But when you use Facebook Messenger, or WhatsApp, or TikTok, or whatever, you know, these apps, or you use what's called a VoIP phone, or, you, or Facebook itself, that's going through the internet. So there's a phone system and there's the internet. Now they're both often, they're both on your cell phone, but um, they often will tell you in a disaster, if your phone call won't go through, try a text. Okay, that's great, try the text. But if your text doesn't go through and your phone doesn't go through, try a messaging app. Try Facebook, Zello. Um, there's some that you can use to push to talk like, like a radio um, that will, will do that. And then of course there's satellite based things which this little one here is this one's not a satellite phone but this will send a text through to a phone it will also if if i fall through a glacier i can push the sos button and it will trigger an emergency rescue but i can still text my family where there's no coverage at all to their cell phone 
and they can look on a map and see where I am. And I can also use this hooked to my cell phone to see a map on my cell phone, even when there's no cell phone coverage uh, on my, where, where I am. So that's, uh, that's something uh, that, you, that you, uh, you've got as an option to you. And I'm just gonna jump ahead here. So I, I, I've mentioned this already, the phone technology. Telephone, you have landline, cell, and text. Those are, if you're using the texting version on your phone only, not iMessage, but the, you know, when it turns green, not blue, it will go through the cellular side of the system, um, but unless you, you know, you, you may not see that somebody's uh, somebody's got it. And I'll also say the Earthquake Alliance people. One of the things that happens in an earthquake is your home phone bounces off, and now it's an open thing, creating a busy signal on the phone circuit. After an earthquake, on your checklist, one thing should be go and hang up my home phone, and just remember that that home phone. Uh, may, need a, may need a battery if the power goes out. If you have Shaw home phone, there's actually a battery that they put into your, um, in, into your garage or somewhere that runs that thing. So then the other technology is internet-based, apps, social media, and I would say make sure that you know how your city is going to communicate back with you during, uh, during a disaster. Um, that's where you wanna go get the, the uh, the real um, information from, from them. And those are all examples of apps uh, that exist that you can try. So even if you FaceTime your family, that means the internet's working. Your phone might not work, but the internet might. So again, we're talking about your emergency communication plan. Think about it that, that you don't, well, I tried calling them. Make a list of the people and the options that you have. I can try phoning them or I can text them if they're kids and never answer their phone, but they always answer their text. So my kids, I'm gonna text them first. Then I'm gonna try phoning them. Then I'm gonna try sending them a, 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 a messenger app. And if that doesn't work, believe it or not, me the ham radio guy, my kids have these. And that's partly because of their outdoor enthusiasts and they're always off doing things. But I guarantee that, that unless there's something that's affected the satellite system, and this is run off the Iridium system, and their headquarters is in Langley, Virginia. It's US military uses it. If that's down, it's a really bad day. And so that's, uh, and then you of course can use Starlink, and Starlink allows you to use the internet via a satellite. And then the last thing, uh, now this is where we get into the good stuff. Uh, all these guys in the yellow vests will, uh, will like this. We talk about radio. There's different modes. There's different, uh, you, can, you can talk with your voice. You can send emails without the internet being in place through a radio, digital modes, those types of things. You can pick the type of radios. You've got a handheld like this. You've got a type of radio that you put in the car and there's locks out there you can go see. And then you can get a radio like this that does not just local. These two will do local greater Vancouver area things, this one will do worldwide. But then it comes into play that you uh, need to also talk about, um, uh, about that technology. These are very inexpensive and they're hard to program. And if you've bought one because you've taken a ham radio license and you've gone and put it in a drawer after somebody's programmed it and you've never tried it, uh, you're, you're really missing out. Is that one we call the Chinese one? Yeah, it's Baofei, yeah. So you need to make sure you have power, and I'm just going to have to hurry along here. Uh, um, uh, backup powers, batteries, or generators. You need to deal with antennas. Now this is, we've got this actually out here. See that there? That corner of the shed? That's actually an antenna. So uh, John right here built that antenna, and the wire's there, and it goes down here, and nobody would know it's there. So if you live in a townhouse complex, you could mount it on the side, paint it the same color. Nobody would ever know it's there. Nobody would ever complain. So now the last thing I'm going to talk about bringing it all together is a PACE plan. And uh, the most important part of this is the act of planning itself. So you've actually got your primary stuff done. You've got your family members or work or neighborhood people listed. And you know how you can contact them. So you start with that and you, you make a list. This is how I normally contact you. If there's something bad going on, I'm gonna phone you, like I always do, if the phone's working, great. If the phone's not working, I'm gonna try and text you. That's my 
alternative route. And then if that doesn't work, maybe my contingency plan will be I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to try my satellite or I'm going to, I'm going to meet, uh, um, my ham radio, you know, if, if it's local. And then the last one is emergency. Now this is a, it's a US military thing that they do all, they always do pace plans, any deployment, anywhere they go, and I'm sure our Canadian military does it as well. The last one, emergency, is typically involved with emergency extraction or pulling somebody out, but it's where do I go to meet you if all other modes of communication fail. So, uh, you know, but five hits, this is John's favorite slide here. Five minutes before, uh, the disaster is not the time to start planning. So I want to just read you something uh, really quickly from, from an amateur radio guy that pulled a bunch of uh, preparedness prepper people and he got answers like, oh yeah, I've got, how are you going to communicate? You know, I've got a bow thing in the drawer or I'm just, I, I programmed it up and I gave it to my non-amateur radio friend and they're going to use it in a disaster because I don't need a license then. And I'll tell you, that won't work. That means you've never practiced. And uh, I'm gonna just move on. So there we go, That's, I've got five comments here for people that have gotten an amateur radio license or think about getting one. If, if you don't know who you're gonna talk to, your radio is useless. If you don't know how you're gonna talk to them on your radio, it's useless. If you don't know how you're gonna power your radio when there's no power, your radio is useless. If you don't know how to, if you don't have a communication plan, what we just talked about a pace plan and knowing who you're going to call, your radio is useless. And if you don't practice with a specific individual consistency, your radio is useless. They're hard to maintain. They require thought, planning, and money. And when it involves technology, often more practicing than you would think. So I would just say be intentional. If you need to know how to use these things, learn. Ask yourself if you've checked all five of those boxes. So we've got lots of people outside that can help you with that. Um, we're offering a basic amateur radio course. One starts on Monday, and you can see John right here uh, out, outside afterwards. If you would like to um, uh, sign up for a class, so I'll see you <coughs> one in September. It is basically an online class with an in-person exam. And we have a very high, high success rate of passing because the, it's such an excellent program that's been put together. I'm also going to invite you to field day. So June 24th, Saturday in Serene, you can go to our website, which the, um, uh, there's how you can get a hold of us. Uh, you can just scan that QR code or uh, on the right, v 7 sarnet or cfar.ca. If you go there, we have an annual emergency exercise, and this has been going on for lots of years. We will be there for 24 hours. So Saturday the 24th at 11 a.m. for 24 hours, you are welcome to stop by. And Larry here, hold up your hand, Larry. Larry's a new amateur radio guy. He's our get on the air guy. And if you come, we will actually let you try the radio and explain things. That's the whole purpose. We want you to actually get over your mic fright, being afraid to, to push the button. Um, and I'll say, so this is a public safety radio, police fire ambulance, and I teach many of the people how to use their radios. And you have people with big trucks, you have people with guns, and they are afraid to push this push to talk button just like you are, until they do it a few times, and then it's second nature. I will also say that Bob Rich, the retired chief of police from the city of Abbotsford, said when given the choice between his radio and a gun, he would take his radio. That's how important communications are. Don't neglect them. So I'll ask for questions. Um, please ask questions or come talk to us outside after. Please go ahead. Where, where is the field day after? The field day, uh, it's at uh, 142 and 57 uh, in Surrey. You can go to our website, which is... Uh, um, uh, under, under just VE7SAR, where, sorry, there, or CPAR.ca, and you can click on, and it will show you, um, it will show you where we meet, and we meet every Saturday morning for breakfast at Denny's at 68 and King George Highway, and, or King George Boulevard, and you are allowed to come, and you're welcome to come there, if you're licensed or not, and then after that, we go down 
to our operations training center, which is at uh, basically 57 and 142, right behind the police detachment, the Surrey RCMP detachment. And uh, we're there and we'll help you answer questions, we'll help you tune an antenna, we'll help you install a radio in your car, we'll help you get on the air and actually understand and you tried something. And Larry runs what's called a net every Thursday night at 8 p.m. If you're brand new and you've never pushed that push to talk on your radio, we can help you program your radio and that's the place to come make your mistakes and uh, join in. So other questions? We've got uh, another pres yeah. presentation coming up, and um, so if you do have a question, I don't want to yeah. stop that, nope. but uh, we have these uh, awesome people out there who will answer whatever questions, even yeah. if you haven't got one right now, and you think of one in a minute. Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate okay. it.